Welcome back to the DCS Sip Rip, everyone, where we discuss news and information about DCS World, the world's premier combat flight simulator for the home PC. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, and hot on the heels of Magnitude 3's announcement of progress recently on the Vault F4U Corsair. This is the World War II bird that I know a lot of you are really looking forward to seeing in game. Well, Flying Eye and Simulations Not to Be Outdone released a lengthy and detailed newsletter on the development progress of the A7E Corsair II. The aircraft has been in the works for some time from the Australian studio who also produced airframes for Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, uh, like many of our third-party developers. So let's take a deep dive into that newsletter and talk a little bit more about the aircraft's history and what all this means for fans of the slough being brought into DCS World. According to the National Navigation Museum, in the early 1960s, the Navy was looking for a replacement for the venerable A-4 Skyhawk and the Sky Raider. The design and development restrictions required that any developer producing the aircraft needed to use one that was based on an aircraft already in service. Charles Fort came up with just such an aircraft that looked rather similar to their renowned F-8 Crusader, especially the distinctive man-eating engine chin intake and the overall shape, although it was a little stubbier and shorter than its earlier cousin, thus earning it the nickname The Slough, short little ugly fucker. The final variant flew in 1968, and while it wasn't a supersonic aircraft like the Crusader, it could carry almost double the ordnance of the A-4 Skyhawk, and had a much greater range. It also boasted, over the course of its development, more significant electronic sensors for targeting, including flare and target recognition attack multi-sensors, or TRAM. The aircraft's first combat mission was over Vietnam in 1970, and it remained in service right up to Desert Storm, having gone through numerous upgrades and iterations during that time. The aircraft was renowned for being reliable, tough, and easy to maintain compared to some of its early counterparts. It became a real workhorse for the Navy during the life of its impressive service, thanks to these attributes, but also including its flexibility in mission roles that it could perform. It is perhaps not as well appreciated as some of its contemporaries as a backbone aircraft. Aircraft, say, like the F-14, certainly captured the public's imagination in the 1980s, as the Navy's premier fleet weapon, thanks to a certain movie called Top Gun. However, aircraft like the A-7 and even the A-6, which were which we're also hoping to see in the game from heat blur in the near future, provided critical mission roles and an evolving threat landscape, which changed as the Cold War came to the end by the late 80s and early 90s. Hi, 11 o'clock, 310, better now. He's coming right. The vision then for our in-game experience is being brought to life by Flying Iron Simulations, who admitted a little bit of a major self-imposed setback in 2023, which involved completely redoing the exterior modeling. This came about in part due to the recruitment of a 3D artist, Oleg, who brought extensive experience of 3D modeling and photogrammetry and also the team's ability to find and actually scan a real A7 aircraft. They went all the way out to Portugal to find such a thing. The team described that they'd already completed a 3D build based on images and blueprints that they had, but the opportunity to accurately scan a real aircraft presented really an unmissable chance to produce a highly detailed 3D model, unable to be matched by blueprints and photographs, which can lead to inaccuracies. This was a tough decision for the team as it then forced them to scrap all the work they'd already done and start anew. The results they hope though, I think, will be worth it. And based on the images that we've seen, uh, the exterior modeling looks absolutely fantastic. I believe therefore it was the right decision. And while it has set them back in terms of overall progress, the team advised that as a result of gathering this new data, they've actually made incredible progress pace on the 3D model, thanks to, in part, Oleg's input 
and that photogrammetry data. Now this includes both exterior and interior scans. We've seen this approach several times now, most noticeably with Heepler's release of the Phantom II, which made extensive use of photogrammetry and laser scanning, but also Magnitude 3 has done similar scans of an F-8 Crusader as part of that uh, aircraft's development for that studio. We uh, haven't had any more word on that particular aircraft, unfortunately. Now the process, as you can guess, provides high details of realism to a 3D model not previously available to early flight sim designers. It provides a massively immersive experience when you get into the aircraft because it truly does match what pilots were seeing and experiencing, visually at least, inside the cockpit. In addition to gathering 3D image data, the team were also able to record switch sounds from the real aircraft rather than use generic sounds, again, in order to boost our authenticity experiences inside the cockpit. Again, it's another nice touch in attention to detail from Flying Iron. The team went into some depth about the Phase 4 portion of their flight model development, which involves a lot of computational fluid dynamics number crunching. If you're unfamiliar with the concept, in simple terms, it involves using computers to calculate the physical flow of air, and in this case it is air, across the surfaces of an aircraft. If you have available data on top of that, this can help you more accurately determine the way in which the model should behave under certain flight envelopes or given circumstances, including variables like velocity, pressure, temperature, density, etc., etc. In days gone by, this was all done almost exclusively with wind tunnel testing and manual calculations, which obviously took a heck of a long time. Wind tunnel testing is still critical, but think back to things like the early Formula One days in the 1970s, where experiments with downforce and wing use started to become popular, which were relatively rudimentary compared to today with, in the absence of computers, and even led to the banning of high wing experiments due to their failure leading to a spate of crashes. Early work of this nature still required a lot of physical testing to find out if the results of the modifications were successful. The failure of designs of this nature also led to deaths, the tragic death of famous New Zealand race driver Bruce McLaren when the back end of his Can-Am M8D race car actually separated from the chassis when he was doing about 180 miles an hour and led to a catastrophic loss of aerodynamic downforce on the Levant Strait in June of 1970 at the Goodwood Circuit. The car spun off the track as he approached the Woodcock corner and he was killed instantly as the car struck an old flag station and disintegrated on impact. It's one of the great losses to motorsport and also New Zealand motorsport. Clarence's name lives on as one of the most successful race car companies in the world and produces, of course, some of the world's most popular luxury sports cars. But it was the advent of computers to take some of this guesswork out of aerodynamic design, which led to performance improvements and sped up design development. It gives you respect, really, for the designers of aircraft pioneering the supersonic age and, of course, the rocket age and the journey to the moon. But even early designs like the de Havilland Mosquito, which obliterated the small bomber designs of the era, are incredible testaments to human endeavors in this area. Flying Iron Team advised that they were able to get hold of new wind tunnel data to complement and validate their CFD data modeling. They've been able to expand on their stability and derivative modeling, replacing linear derivatives with complete nonlinear tables, which gives them much more accurate simulation of aircraft dynamics. They explained that this was useful at and beyond the edge of performance envelopes information. Previously, they were using NASA's OpenVSB CFD software, which based on the data they had, provided them with a crude representation of the A7 and a simple performance mesh. It gave them, they stated, acceptable results, which had already been plugged into the flight model. With the capture of scans from the real A7, however, they were able to rebuild the simple mesh to give it much more data resolution and accuracy data not available in literature they were able then to make use of in this system such as things like landing gear forces and speed brake forces. The scanning work has provided a one-to-one -one accuracy of the mesh and data collected which is impressive stuff. To supplement their work they have had input from research and flight to refine the new model and ensure that the validity of the data that they collected was accurate. They advise that this not only benefits the A7 but also opens doors for models of any future aircraft with full EFM fidelity. Now these modules also have a lot of work that goes on underneath the exterior skins and the flight model. One of these is the engine simulation and they said that 2023 also saw an expansion 
of the development of the aircraft's TF-41 engine. Data reports and engine simulation software has been used to calculate the engine's performance along with ongoing work with its subsystems and quirks. One feature of the quirks are a relatively slow response time which adds challenges to things like carrier landing and air-to-air -air refueling. In other words, you'll need to think well ahead of the jet to maintain desired on-speed sets for these kinds of activities or bad things are going to happen. It's true of a lot of aircraft in DCS uh, in the real world as well as in the game. Now, as part of the performance package, they indicated they have completed the automatic flight control system for the aircraft, which includes a control augmentation system. The aircraft has multiple autopilot operating modes as well, and they advise the AFCS, Automatic Flight Control System, is now awaiting testing since it is complete, which is really promising news. Now, this was an area that really interested me, which they described as optimization and efficiency. They explained that some of the calculus behind their flight model and new processes that have been used to improve efficiency include work around the empirical flow model. Now, in DCS World, it typically simulated an empirical flow model every 0.005 seconds, which means the flight model is updated and recalculated around 200 times per second. The rationale for this is that it's a necessary calculation to allow for the representation of the aerodynamic model in conjunction with accurate measurement of pilot inputs while providing the appropriate levels of sensitivity and resolution. Aerodynamic models consist of huge amounts of data, they say, sometimes thousands of data points split into as many as 100 or more different tables. Inefficiencies in the EFM model then can manifest themselves as performance degradations at all times in the flight, which is obviously problematic. So if you're wondering here, I think, why some of you may still be CPU bound in game, I think these processes could hint at some of the challenges associated with complex aerodynamic modeling. If you add in multiple aircraft and things like weight turbulence, which reflected simulations recommended switching off if you're running a lot of planes in game in a recent video on getting the best eye candy and frame rates, and you can see some of the demands flight sim games generate on even the best systems. Moving back to flying irons, efforts to combat inefficiencies, they tackled the speed of processing simulation loops by increasing the speed and efficiency of their lookup tables. Traditionally, the required data in a LUT or lookup table is stored in tables which have approximately 20 to 30 rows and columns. The computer takes an input such as an AOA and loops through the table until it finds the nearest matching values and through mathematical interpolation determines the correct value based on the input. It's repeated for each table of which there can be more than 100 and the whole process is repeated 200 times per second. To improve the efficiency of this, the team indicated that storing the previous result and using that as a starting point for the next search loop through the data table, this is a good place to start. While it helps, major or large input changes will still require a new and full search loop. So they came up with a method that negates the need for searching or loops and explain that they have been able to generate a system that manipulates their data sets to maintain a linear relationship between inputs and corresponding data tables. The table index or where to look in the table can be computed from the table input value. They also added, and here's where it starts getting kind of really interesting, in the model n dimension tables in order for the system to handle any fresh CFP, uh, CFD data they can throw it at. Not only does this work for performance reasons, but the LUT model being the cornerstone of the EFM, they say, means it can also be reused for any future models. So not being a mathematician, I guess a lot of this is well above my rudimentary grasp, but I think it's clear that the team are pushing some really interesting concepts in a way uh, that should benefit this flight model and will operate in the game in hopefully what is a more efficient and realistic way. The flight models are some of the more complex components of these digital models, and this was raised in the discussion that Magnitude 3 brought up with the design holdups that they've had with the Corsair. Really interesting discussion point, and like I said, I don't understand all of it, but certainly what they describe sounds to me like a much more, again, efficient way. I mean, we're talking, you know, fractions of a second, but these can be all the difference when it comes to how the game runs and how the flight model is modeled in the game or interpreted through the systems that are uh, controlling it, which I think is really cool.
Now, as you can imagine, with an aircraft of this era, it actually spanned both the analog age and the arrival of the digital one. So in some ways, it's a little bit of a hybrid of a modern jet, which features things like a HUD, while also sporting a really complex hydraulic analog system. We've seen this in discussion with things uh, like the F-14 from pilots who speculated what could have happened if that aircraft was actually equipped with a proper fly-by-wire system, which uh, was something that was touted for the aircraft, but was never uh, fully in vogue at the time until the aircraft like the F-16 and the F-18 came along. So it was an opportunity missed in many respects. Now the A-7 likewise has a myriad of mechanical systems like the F-14, which require simulation in-game. And the team state that it makes up a considerable portion of the airframe including its procedures and overall simulation experience. An example they provided is the air brake, which is subject to intense pressure and forces at high speed and can be buffeted and pushed back and partially retracted if there is strong enough wind flow or airflow. Since it is hydraulically operated, it is also subject to drooping and partially opening if there is a hydraulic pressure failure or degradation in some way. They advise that, and this is exciting news, they are using a late era A7, which includes automatic maneuvering flaps, which greatly improve turn performance and maneuverability at low speed. The system partially extends the trailing and leading edge flaps when AOA exceeds 14.75 units and air speeds drop below 0.7 mark. It will retract below 10.5 units or above 0.7 mark. And the team explained that the system has been completed and fully integrated into the model in 2023. Now, while the Corsair is known as a Navy bird, there were some variants that were required by the Air Force who also had specific needs and demands, which actually led to some improvements in performance, which, as you've probably guessed by now, were implemented on these later variants. Uh, one of these was that automatic maneuvering flaps and engine improvements. Now, forgetting the Air Force for a while, because this ultimately is really a carrier bird, most of you will be eager to hear that the plane has been tested on the carrier deck in-game, including launches and traps. They advise that landing the aircraft on the ship is immensely difficult and state that success will not come easily as it didn't in real life for the Corsair or the Crusader. The latter was positively lethal, especially at night. Now, regardless of these exciting challenges, the team described that they have completed work on the launch bar system and the arresting hook system, as well as the nose wheel steering and braking systems, as well as the landing systems we mentioned earlier, among other things. They highlighted the convoluted engineering involved with things like the aircraft's nose wheel assembly and control, which is electronically controlled and hydraulically actuated via a hydraulic cylinder mounted on the nose gear shock strut. When not energized, the system provides an automatic nose gear shimmy damping function to reduce nose wheel wobble and smoother taxiing experiences. Engage it and pilots will be able to steer via the rudders at up to 60 degrees off center and it is activated by the nose wheel steering button on the grip. Hydraulic power for the aircraft comes via the PC2 system. Automatic recentering of the nose gear occurs during gear retraction or when the weight on wheel sensor determines that there is no weight on the gear. A servo valve then blocks hydraulic pressure and a spring-loaded damper shutoff valve then moves into position connecting the left and right sides of the nose gear steering system into a damping orifice, restoring the shimmy damping functionality. This complexity they've been able to recreate, meaning you'll need to make sure that the utilities valve is open, you have sufficient hydraulic pressure and the flaps are set in the correct position, while also making sure you don't exceed the 60 degree limitation. They advise if you screw this up, you could find yourself off the deck of the aircraft carrier. So again, it's a lot of attention to detail in the systems and the way that they are implemented in the aircraft is what they're trying to get across here. There are other similar complex hydraulic analog systems, such as the landing gear operation and emergency release system. To calculate some of this, they had to overcome DCS's rigid body physics to recreate realistic simulation of hydraulic compression. And that came up as a discussion point in some of the animations that we have seen with the F-14 and the work that they have done there as the aircraft comes to land. This was earlier this year, I think. So you'll see on carrier landings when the arrestor hook is compressed, they say, uh, more reali realistic simulation of that hydraulic compression. 
They're still working on things like the suspension model and the fuel systems and many systems of this nature appear to be in various stages of completion, according to the team. Again, exciting stuff. Sensors and avionics. Well, the team described that they spent a lot of time this year on improving the realism of the flow of information that occurs in the A7 suite of computers and sensors. Remember that at its inception and release, it carried a pretty sophisticated array of computer systems compared to a lot of contemporary aircraft. And again, this put it at the leading edge of aircraft development. So one area of its sophistication was targeting computers for bomb dropping, and this allowed for much more accuracy in bombing and precision if such a thing truly exists. To process all of the information that the A7's sensor systems gather, the aircraft uses the AN ASN 91 V or 5 tactical comp computer, which are the brains of the aircraft. To recreate all of this data crunching simulation, the team have access today to the NATOPS manual regarding information flow, which they said was invaluable. The first portion of the information chain has been the aircraft sensors and recreating accurately the Corsair's unique AOA, which like the F-14, uh, excuse me, which you may be familiar with, it uses units rather than precise degrees of angle to measure where the nose is pointing in space. It's still precise, it just doesn't use those uh, degrees as a, as a measure of AOA. Now, in addition to generating accuracy, part of the challenge is also representing damage to any sensors and their impact to the avionics suite. Through 2023, this, they say, the team have completed the air data computer and begun work on the IMS system and also integrating systems correctly in the chain of information flow. They expect to continue tweaking and working on advanced features of the tactical computer right up until the aircraft's release in game. So to that end, the team tackled the obvious question, and I'm sure you're wondering too, when will it be released in game? Well, sadly, they couldn't reveal a specific timeline or date release even down to the year only that they expect in early 2024 that they'll be in phase four of development and later during the year testing will occur so i don't expect perhaps that we'll see much more in ongoing detail maybe not until the middle of next year a possible release i suspect well uh, at the earliest it would be the end of 2024 so a year away uh, but it's difficult to know exactly it's much more likely i think to see uh early 2025 release that's what i'm guessing and they pointed out they're a small studio they have plenty of enthusiasm for the module but they just don't have the level of resources that could knock this kind of thing out in a two-year period. So we'll have to wait and see. It's frustrating in a, in a little bit of a way because I, I know many of us have been waiting for an aircraft like this, another Cold War one. But at the same time, I have to applaud them and the work that they're doing, including that setback with the exterior modeling, only to probably gain more from that uh, decision, which I think was, as I said before, the right one. I think we can agree, though, that uh, as disappointing as it has been to, to see some setbacks and a long development process, the screenshots that we've seen thus far really do portray the high level of fidelity that this aircraft is going to bring and uh, the high level of, of detail and attention to detail that we expect from modules of this kind of nature these days. And of course, when you have high expectations or there, there are gauntlets laid down by some of the teams, then that creates delays, I guess, or uh, demands to, to increase the amount of detail um, and realism that we expect from these modules. And, and I think that's a fair thing. And I think it's ultimately a good thing for DCS World. So the takeaways from this development report are that the team, they really are quite far along, really, in the deep processes involved in developing an aircraft of this nature, which I'm handing out here. We're talking about the physical hardware, modeling, computer systems, and simulations, and very, very importantly, that flight model design, which as you heard, is time consuming and complicated to recreate. If they pull this off successfully, and I have no doubt they will, I expect it will be another milestone development for a third-party developer in DCS World, uh, where quite frankly the gauntlet has been laid down by heat blur with the F-14 and certainly the F-4 Phantom II's release, which was packed full of interesting details and goodies that we haven't really seen before or discussed quite so openly, perhaps with some other third-party developers or even um, Eagle Dynamics in terms of damage modeling and system wear and all those kinds of things. So there's some interesting takeaways from that. And of course, we can't ignore the more recent release of Razbam's Mighty F-15E, which has been years in the making 
and features one of the best radars in the game, along with that fantastic terrain following feature. It's a magnificent piece of engineering from a third party developer to recreate one of the more popular modules in the game and certainly one of the more successful aircraft ever developed for the US Air Force. So I'm really intrigued by the angle that Flying Iron has taken here to employ uh, regarding both the CFD work that they talked about in conjunction particularly with the EFM work which incorporates some pretty fancy math jazz to circumvent number crunching involved with regards to the input output stuff that we talked about earlier that is the flight models calculation within the DCS game and how it uh, operates. I haven't seen this kind of discussion previously from other developers, and I'm really curious if this is a unique solution to that portion of the airframe's functionality as modeled live in the game. I'm also interested if that is something that we're going to see implemented with other aircraft or uh, other developers. Uh, I think this has broader appeal and broader functionality for other developers too. So again, we'll have to wait and see what that looks like. So broader thoughts, speaking of broad here, I think this aircraft signals too the importance and the general popularity of a range of Cold War aircraft currently being injected in the game. Remember, this includes things like a potential for a revamped MiG-21 from Magnitude 3 and also the F-8 Crusader, which is still in the works. We haven't really seen much uh, information on that though. Uh, we have the MiG-15, we have the MiG-19 in development um, with the MiG-23 from RASBAM, the F-15 is uh, DCS. Uh, the MiG-17 too from Red Star Simulations, the F-104 from, from Argus who announced that. We have the A-1 Sky Raider from Crosstail Studios and we also have the F-100D from Grinelli Designs. There are a few others too out there but the important thing to note is that this once niche of aircraft is rapidly really becoming quite the bulk of DCS design direction primarily for third party developers and studios. The practical advantage is the published technical information, which you can use to base your design work on, and the availability and accessibility to airframes, many of which are still in flying condition, which is awesome. You can't just walk onto an Air Force base in the United States here and ask to scan a jet. That's likely to get you detained. Uh, but you can on occasion get permission, it seems, to scan a museum-owned piece, and that uh, I think with the growth in DCS popularity it helps, I believe, open doors for future access to other aircraft. Uh, one thing I'd love to see, there's a host of British Cold War airplanes, which I think are absolutely fantastic. I would love to see, for example, the Buccaneer and also the Jaguar, which are a frequent wish list demand from the community. So there's a lot of aircraft out there available still in this era, which would be welcome, I think, with this growing community. It's cool stuff. Now, of course, as all of this is very, very exciting, we still need another piece of the puzzle, and that are maps to support campaigns for these wonderful planes. And we really need something from the Southeast Asia portion of the world, or what I'm calling the Vietnam option. Uh, pour in some 1960s and 1970s naval assets, add planes like the A6, the A7, the F8, the F4. We've got a collection of fast-turning, hard-to-see hard MiGs as well. Like I said before, with the MiG-17, the MiG-15, the MiG-21, etc., we've got an Enigma server heaven here for high-variety mission sets, I think. And I include here challenging seed missions and a ton of mission options based on real events, which could be really, really enthralling. Uh, get that uh, portion going too with some campaign makers. And we really are looking at some exciting stuff. We really will have a ball out there. So if you're looking for some motivation too on the joys and challenges of flying some of the aircraft that we've just talked about from both sides of the Cold War curtain, check out Ward Carroll's more recent video of the interview that he did with Hida Heatley, which was really exciting uh, and interesting. Hida flew several Red 4 aircraft as part of his work in um, DAC training or DACT, dissimilar aircraft training. And it was really interesting listening to his tales and also the comparisons between several aircraft that we've discussed today. And it's all about uh, um, flying to your weaknesses and strengths, etc., etc., and recognizing how to overcome some of those prob uh, problems, which uh, are really interesting discussion points about dogfighting and about um, you know the different roles that aircraft had 
And like we've kind of been discussing, the A7 is going to fit a really exciting niche along with the Phantom and the A6 as well. So we've got some really interesting aircraft being introduced to the game that are going to provide a really fun time for us. So I'll add a description to that Heater Heatley um, interview below from Ward Carroll. It was a really enjoyable one. There's uh, several interviews recently that I've, I've been enamored with lately. Let me know what your thoughts are anyway on the A7 in the comments section below. All right, so that wraps up a long sit rep this week with regards to a really cool aircraft. Thanks to all of you for watching. Thanks for all the support for the channel. I really appreciate it, all the discussion points. To this end, I would like to do um, the Phantom 2 giveaway, which uh, is going to a random subscriber from last week. Has to be a subscriber, and the lucky winner this week is uh, Chris C. 3561. Chris C. 3561, that's you. Uh, Chris, if you want to reach out to me buried in the channel, you will find my email address in the community section, wherever it is. Uh, shoot me an email and we'll get in touch. Um, uh, only Napalm 2 reached out to me a few weeks ago with regards to another um, giveaway that we're doing. And hopefully that uh, won't be too far away for, for him because he was looking for the Corsair, the original Corsair. So uh, yeah, we'll do another giveaway, I think, towards the end of the year. It will be a Strike Eagle, I think, to celebrate the, the Striegel and wrapping up the end of the year in the interim. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all the support once again. And we'll see you next time on the DCS Sit Rep. This is Prickly Hedgehog out.